Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, you have joined session, Can You Feel It? Social and Emotional Competencies and Hope Conquers Aces. Today, uh, our presenters are Kristen uh, Bonet and Holly Wentworth. Uh, Kristen has spent several years working directly with at-risk families and the prof professionals who serve them, particularly around the area of attachment. She holds a bachelor's degree in child development and family relations and is a certified professional coach. Kristen is also a certified circle of security facilitator, a stewards of family facilitator, and is trained in attachment and bio behavioral catch-up, ABC. Currently, Kristen lives in Coeur d'Alene and is a member of the Strengthening Families Roundtable, Hope Conquers ACES Community of Practice, and has recently become a CASA advocate. And Holly, uh, my friend Holly, is over, let me scroll down just a second. Holly is, uh, Wentworth is working with families and children for 25 years. She holds a bachelor's degree in family and human development and emphasis in early childhood development. She is a program manager at Eastern Idaho Public Health, where she works to provide evidence-based home visiting services to families. Uh, her work is focused on primarily helping families with preventative health care, education, infant mental health, preventing child abuse and neglect, and facilitating opportunities for parent education. Holly is a trainer for Idaho STARS and is active across the state facilitating home visiting and programs that strengthen families. Welcome to this session and I'm going to turn it over to you wonderful ladies. Okay, thank you so much Shannon and thank you everyone for being here. It is good to see everyone and to be able to interact with everyone. Uh, this feels a little different uh, but so happy that we can make these connections because the connections and the learning feel the same, even though it's in a little different model. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up our presentation. I'm happy to be here with Kristen today. <clears throat> And like Shannon said, I um, work for Eastern Idaho Public Health in our home visiting program and work with um, many families. And I'm just excited to be here and I'm gonna let Kristen say anything about herself that she wants to now. I feel like that was a great introduction. Um, just also that I'm so happy to be uh, with everybody. I wish we were in person and I know hopefully next year we'll get to be together in person, but it's great to connect with everybody, at least in this way for now. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Holly. Okay. Kristen and I wanted to get an idea about um, what brings all of you here today, what role you play in supporting families. And so we have, we're going to use the Minty Meter that you became familiar yesterday with. And Carrie's going to bring that link up for us and guide us through that. But we have a poll and we'd like you to just answer uh, based on what your role is, the answer that fits best for you in this poll. Great. So you should be seeing, look, at, you're already ahead of me. You got the link there in the chat, which is a quick way just to bring you straight in, or you can use a separate device. Go to menti.com in any browser and use that code you see at the top there, 34718880. And you can see the responses coming in now. This is so cool. <laughs> oh, look at that. We have 87 participants, and you can see down here in the corner the number that I've voted just to give you a feel. Okay, an idea. Okay. So it looks like we have a pretty good mix. Um, we have more that come from the social work, counselor side, and service coordination, which is great. And then it looks like we also have some program administration. And many who are from the early childhood field, Head Start, uh, Pre-K, 
early care and learning, home visiting fields. So that's, that's good to see too. So our hope is today that we're able to bring something to each of you that is going to be relevant for your work. And so we appreciate knowing just what brings you here and what kind of work you do with families because that will help us as we guide the conversation. Today, your experiences are valuable to Kristen and I in terms of learning together. So we have a variety of ways that we're going to share what your experiences and your thoughts are on the topic of social emotional competence with, with families and children. So it looks like the final uh, percentage has come in at 48% that come from the social work counselor arena service coordination, 21 from admin, and then 32 from the early childhood field. So thank you, Carrie. Back to you. Okay. So I think on the next slide, we also have a Mentimeter, right, Holly? Yes. I love these Mentimeters. This is so cool. And I think this one is the word cloud, much like we did yesterday. And the, I'm having a hard time advancing the presentation. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we would like to ask this question as well and have you enter your responses, which is acknowledging that things have changed for all of us recently, right? Things are constantly changing. <clears throat> and we just want to take a second to, to acknowledge that and to share how has it been for you the last six months with changes in the social and emotional landscape so maybe just a word or a, sh a short phrase about how has that been same link same code so wonderful you guys are doing great look at this got some people posting in the chat too so that's that's lovely um and hopefully your words in the chat are showing up in the, the mentimeter too <laughs> mm. Is there, Carrie, is there any way like we were able to save this last from yesterday? Is there a way we can save it? Most definitely. I'll, I'll prepare that for you. Thank you. Wow, I'm hearing, I'm seeing ones like whiplash, <laughs> things, words that I hadn't consider, considered before for this, but are so true. Uh, adapting, the worst you're ever telling, virtual disconnect, rough, wild. I also saw some in there, peaceful, blessed, personal mm -hmm. growth, eye-opening. So it's interesting on the continuum, all the emotions that we've had. Yeah. Looks like they're still coming in. So we have, what, 89? And we are at 74 people. Some people might have put it in the chat, I hear. So, blessed, hard, uncertain. Some of these smaller ones. Look at these bigger words, overwhelming, stressful, challenging, exhausting, right? And we might answer these all different on different days. Some days it might be chaotic or lonely or stressful and other days we might feel energized or creative or peaceful. We wanted to show, to do this uh, word cloud to show just how impactful this time has been for all of us. These words carry a lot of weight, right? These are very powerful words. And it's something that we're, while we're all kind of collectively going through this experience, 
we're also all having our own individual experiences and um, and that's just something that we're going to be talking about more today. So I think we have almost everybody in here. Okay. It's awesome. Difficult. I think we got everybody. So if you want to share the next screen, Polly. Thank you everybody for contributing to that. You want it? This is it is not advancing and it did this last time. Hmm. Uh, sometimes you can try like up arrow, down arrow, page up, page down. Let's see if one of those works. I'm trying the arrows, page up. That is funny. Okay. Uh, if you hover down in the lower left, do you see how? Yep, yeah, there you go. And you can use those arrows as well. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Carrie. Okay. Yep. All right. We're all learning together. So today, some of our learning targets that we wanna, wanna achieve are understanding the Hope Conquers ACEs initiative and how this aligns with the protective factors. Uh, so many of us are familiar with the protective factors, but maybe not as much with how it does align with the Hope research. We wanna explore the connection between social and emotional competence and the protective factors during this time of COVID-19. We wanna discuss how we can support parents in understanding and helping their children talk about feelings that are related to stress and anxiety, something that we all need all of the time, but especially maybe as we're going through this time. And then we wanna reflect on the capacity of uh, how one in interaction can be a force for good. <clears throat> okay, we wanna give a little background on Hope Conquers ACEs. This is our statewide community of practice that started in 2018 and if you don't know about it, this will give you a little bit of background. Um, Idaho Children's Trust Fund received a grant from Blue Cross of Idaho. And they reached out to partners across the state initially, and there were 20 of us. And they had also reached out to Maureen Durning, who is on the call with us today, and Jane Zink, who wrote a curriculum that's entitled Strong. And it has in it lesson plans activities and information related to the protective factors. Um, after they initially trained 20 people, they sent us out around the state to begin talking about hope or healthy outcomes through positive experiences, uh, which is based on Dr. Sege's work that we learned about yesterday, positive childhood experiences and what a difference they make in combating adverse childhood experiences. So this has been exciting for our state because what we've learned through the whole process is that hope is vital uh, and the initiative has grown since then to include uh, hundreds of presentation over 3,000 attendees and uh, more trainers more people have been trained so i wanted to let you know about the strong curriculum that that can be a resource and a tool for you to work uh, to use in your program for program planning, for individual one-on-one -on -one work with parents or children, uh, for group work with parents or other educational initiatives that you might have, have. If you're interested in the strong curriculum, we have contact information for Maureen at the end of our presentation. I will tell you just personally, uh, we adopted this strong curriculum for use in our parents as teachers program and and plan our group meetings around a lot of the activities and education that is in the strong curriculum. So it's a great resource that we have here in Idaho and it's a framework like we said that's built on the protective factors 
And um, you may know about those protective factors, um, their resiliency, social connections, uh, concrete support in times of need, knowledge of child development, and social emotional competence, which is what Kristen and I are going to address today. And the protective factors are exactly that. They're a framework. So it allows you to uh, scaffold and build your program around what, what uh, protective factors you need. So we wanted to do a, uh, a poll to kind of see about gauge where everybody was on the protective factors. So we'll go ahead and let Carrie bring up that Zoom poll. It's going to ask you some questions. I use the protective factors framework in my work all the time. I'm thinking about using it. I don't know about it or I want to learn more. So go ahead and take that poll. It looks like we have quite a few people um, who are using the protective factors, which is so exciting. And then we have quite a few people that would like to learn more about it and see if it fits into their work. So we'll share those results with you now. You can see them there. And some that don't know about it and, and those that are thinking about using it. So we hope you've come to the right place today. And by the end of the day, you'll know whether this would be something that you would want to work to use in the work that you do. Uh, okay, thank you, Carrie. So, um... Before we get into the protective factors, we did want to review just for a second um, ACEs because it is Hope Conquers ACEs. And I know we got to learn a lot about this yesterday. Uh, but just remembering that ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And that study showed that there is a significant increase in health issues and risks with the higher amount of ACEs that a child experiences. So I don't want to spend too much time on that because we, we did spend a lot yesterday, but um, we just wanted to give a quick reminder of what that is. And we wanted to give you a quick reminder of what HOPE is too. You've heard a lot about it yesterday, but just a reminder that the HOPE Conquers ACEs initiative in Idaho is based on that mindset shift, looking through a strength-based lens at parents and families uh, appreciating those strengths, realizing that the family has expertise and, and providing opportunities and experiences that are going to increase the well-being of families, cultivate positive relationships for families, and help families identify how to have healthy environments or how to seek out healthy environments for their family. Um, the Hope Conquers ACEs initiative and the strong curriculum is also based in those four building blocks of hope that we talked about yesterday, which was the relationships, the uh, engagement, knowing that they can contribute something positive, social and emotional competence, and then uh, living, learning, and playing in healthy environments. So here, um... We wanted to show how hope aligns with the protective factors that we've been talking about. And so the protective factors are there on that left side and the positive experiences are there on the right side. And so the protective factor of resiliency, strengthening families defines that as managing stress and functioning well when faced with challenges, adversity, and trauma. We hear a lot about resiliency these days. And then the protective factor of knowledge of parenting and child development is understanding child development and parenting strategies that support physical, cognitive, language, social, and emotional development. 
And those protective factors align with the positive experience of being in nurturing, supportive relationships. <clears throat> and there on the left side, social connections, that protective factor. We define that as positive relationships that provide emotional, informational, instrumental, and spiritual support. And that aligns with the positive experience of having opportunities for constructive social engagement and to develop a sense of connectedness. And there, that third one, that third protective factor of concrete supports, uh, is concrete support in times of need, we define as access to concrete support and services that address a family's need and help minimize stress that's caused by challenges. And the positive experience that it aligns with is living, developing, and learning in a safe, sta stable, protective, and equitable environment. And then that last one, which we're talking about today, the social emotional competence that protective factor is defined as family and child interactions that help children develop the ability to communicate clearly, recognize and regulate their emotions, and to establish and maintain relationships. And Hope also calls this learning social and emotional competencies. And strengthening families is all about recognizing, obviously, the strengths that a family has. No person or family exists only within their risk factors, within those adverse experiences, right? We also have positive experiences and strengths. And strengthening families uses the approach of assuming that each person and family and community has their own unique set of strengths. And we can think about these risk factors and their strengths on each one of these levels. So we have, um, using the social ecological model, the child and the individual, the family and parents, the community and programs, and society. And it's important to recognize that each of these obviously interact with one another and affect, have an effect on the other ones. So considering that and thinking about this time of COVID, we wanted to take a little bit of uh, time to talk about ourselves. Obviously, what we feel is important, what our experience is, is important, and it impacts our children. It impacts the other relationships that we have, the people that we work with, and so on. So. Uh, Holly and I discussed three different things on the next slide that we want you to consider. So I'm going to be spending a little bit of time on this slide uh, just talking through these things. Obviously, there are many things that you could consider about your own social and emotional uh, health during this time. But these were three that we decided we, we wanted to share with you today that maybe we could think about in a different way and help us take inventory of where we're at as we go through this time. So the first one is to think about our patterns. We've heard in other trainings and yesterday during our, with Dr. Saye, our brain is hardwired to keep us safe above all other things. And because of that, we all have our own unique patterns and our patterns help us to feel safe. They are there to make us feel safe and comfortable. And some of, our, some of us are aware of what patterns we have or aware of some of the patterns that we have. And sometimes we have patterns that we might not even know exist or be aware of that we have in our life. And sometimes our patterns are helpful to us, and sometimes they aren't as helpful to us. And so when we're thinking about COVID, we want to consider how we have had to integrate this experience into our existing patterns. So for some of us, our patterns are, it makes it easier for us 
to go through this time. If I was already an introverted person or I really liked being home or I already worked from home and I preferred that, um, then it would be easier, obviously, maybe for me to go through this experience. Then for somebody who you really relies on being out and in around other people and having social interactions face to face as a part of their resiliency. And so recognizing our patterns is important because it helps us have compassion and understanding for ourselves. And it helps us have compassion and understanding for what other people are going through. Another pattern to consider is our self-talk. Do, do you tend to have negative self-talk when things are difficult? Or do you tend to have positive self-talk? When you're stressed, do you uh, tend to get into limiting beliefs and, and uh, have more of that negative self-talk that I was just saying? Or do you tend to uh, reach out to others and figure things out together? So it's just something to think about. How do, how do we integrate this experience into our existing patterns? And one question that we can ask ourselves is, what patterns have I noticed in myself during this time? And is this pattern serving me the way I want it to? And if not, what might I be needing that this pattern doesn't support? So it's just a little bit of reflection around that. Holly, do you have anything to add to that one? I think it's it's been interesting through COVID-19, at least my experience has been that um, all of a sudden I'll be going along thinking everything's okay and then all of a sudden I'll have this emotion come up and I'll think, where did that come from? That's never been there before. And I've really had to work on identifying that I have to think about how I'm feeling in a more intentional way than I did before. So that's kind of been a new pattern I've had to integrate into uh, this experience because all of a sudden I'll feel more agitated or all of a sudden I'll feel myself wanting to isolate or, or, or do things that usually I don't do. And so I think that that's been interesting to identify what patterns we usually use and then what new ones we're creating as we go through this. I don't know if anyone else has had that experience, but that, that's what's happened for me. Uh, sometimes it's easy. It's not easy to recognize our patterns when we're in them, but when we look back, we can see, wow, I was making choices or getting into habits that were maybe not serving me the way that, you know, I needed them to. I need them to. And so um, recognizing our patterns is also helpful because it just gives us information about what we might be needing. I think somebody shared. I am seeing a few things. I'm staying up too late to decompress. It's a pattern I need to overcome. Yeah. And if any of you would like to share, I'd love to see um, what patterns you might be recognizing in this time about yourself. So thank you for sharing. Okay, so the second thing we thought that might be helpful to consider is acceptance. And by acceptance, I mean the active participation with what is going on in this moment. That in this moment, I accept this is how things are. What I don't mean by acceptance is being like passively resigned to a situation or giving up or just saying it is what it is. That is not what I mean. What I mean is that ability to just be present in this moment and say, this is what's going on for me. And it's important because it allows us to ask questions and have perspective that supports us from this moment moving forward. So the opposite of acceptance would really be resistance. You know, when we're focused on the way we wish things were, when we're focused on how things used to be, uh, we can be in resistance of what is happening in this moment. And the, the problem with that is that that can keep us stuck. 
And so when we do practice acceptance, it allows us to adapt and to learn and to grow. And by the way, we can accept things and also want them to change, right? I can oftentimes acceptance is the first step to change because it allows us to connect with what reality is for us right now. So I can accept that things are not the way that I like them and while at the same time wanting them to be different. But the acceptance is the first step to helping us make decisions that would change things. And I think acceptance for me personally has been a very liberating experience. In each moment when I'm feeling, I'm realizing I'm feeling stuck, it is a cue to me that maybe there's something here I'm not accepting. Maybe I need to take inventory of what's going on in this moment. And accepting what's going on may inspire us to see things differently or to see things in a more intentional, productive way. And I liked how uh, Holly described this when we were talking about it as being a, acceptance being a doorway into new opportunities and meaningful choices. And so I wanna use myself as an example right now. I'm getting ready to move to Montana. It's a beautiful outside. I love, I live up in Coeur d'Alene. I wanna be outside doing fun things, but I've had to be inside packing and doing all the stuff that I need to get done. And so I was feeling really stressed for a couple days in a row. And it really helped me one night when I said, you know what, in this moment, this is what I have to do. So I might not like that this is what I have to do, but I'm going to accept that this is where I need to be in order to get the things done that matter to me right now. So a question that we might ask ourselves here is, is there something that I may be feeling resistant to or about? And if so, what is it? And how might acceptance help me move forward? So I see in the chat, I want to get to this a little bit in terms of patterns. Looks like we have some planners. COVID has helped this person develop a new pattern of being flexible. My joy is less not gone, but less. Things seem harder across the board from connecting to grocery shopping. And we've had some family members with some life-changing diagnosis during this time, but we can't connect and that's very hard. It's really hard. That is hard. I can accept I'm not able to travel to visit my family, but I can do FaceTime, yes. So I accept that right now I want to do this thing, but I can't do it. Here's what I can do. And um, many of our important connections are not from computers, and this too shall pass. Yes. Polly, do you want to add anything on this topic of acceptance? No, I think the comments covered it beautifully. Yeah. All right, so the last thing that we have there is self-compassion. We've, I've been hearing about this as a theme throughout this conference so far, and I think it's, it's so relevant right now. Um, sometimes it's easier for us to be compassionate with other people than it is for us to be compassionate with ourselves. And we are living in a really uncertain time where we can't always anticipate what's coming next. We can't always plan the way that we want to. And that can make it really stressful, um, a stressful time and a time that means even more that we need to practice self-compassion and that our feelings, what we think and what we feel matters and it's okay. So, one of the things though that I think is a good practice with self-compassion is recognizing duality, that two things can be true at the same time. So we have a lot, there's a lot of strong opinions going on in the world, a lot of strong 
feelings, a lot of, um, we're, we're just hearing a lot of strong emotions, right? And we may be having strong emotions too. And I think it's important to recognize that uh, what I feel and what I think can be true and what you think and what you feel can be true. Two things can be true at the same time. So just having compassion with ourselves helps us have compassion with other people as well. And uh, just giving ourselves grace that sometimes we uh, might feel overwhelmed by the things that are going on or our feelings and that's, that's okay, it is a stressful time. Um, and another piece that I wanna share with this around self-compassion is something I share in one of my other trainings, which is the reminder that people do not always need to hear that things are okay. That's not what we always need to hear. What we do need to hear is that even if things are not okay, we are capable of dealing with those things and we aren't alone. So I wanna say that again. The reminder that we don't need to always hear that things are okay. We need to hear that we're capable of dealing with things if they're not okay and that we're not alone. And that is something that I feel like is really important for me in my practice of self-compassion is that this might not feel okay right now, but I know I can handle it and I'm not alone. So it's just a, a way of being encouraging towards others, but also just being encouraging to ourselves, reminding ourselves that we can do hard things and we have done hard things. Um, so I just wanna finish with the, the, this question, which is to ask ourselves, um, is there a place in my life where I can be a little bit more gentle with myself? Can I be okay with being good enough? Can I give myself some credit for all the things I've done and I'm doing and allow myself some space to breathe and to hold space for myself as much as I do for other people? So those are just three things that we really wanted to touch on that might help us in our own experience with social emotional competence during this time. And the, this social and emotional development, one of the goals that we have when we're considering us as adults and as caregivers regarding uh, social emotional competence, these are some important points that we wanna help parents to understand how their emotions impact them and how they impact their children's emotions. The positive experiences and responses lead to feelings of safety and success that caregivers also need feelings of connection and security so they can feel safe themselves, that human brains are hardwired to keep us safe, and that this current situation is a test of people's capacity to be resilient, dealing with uncertainty, conflicting information, tension, and wondering, you know, when will this change? How will it change? Okay, so Kristen has taken us through um, social emotional development, some points for adults, us as adults, and we wanted to touch on that because we know that's an important part of how we support children socially and emotionally. So keeping that in mind, we'd like to next go to an opportunity to have you experience one of the activities from the strong curriculum and it has to do with it's called my emotional landscape and after Kristen introduced some of the principles of uh, social emotional well-being uh, this will give you an opportunity to kind of think about where did you learn about how to react to things where did you learn how to do emotions and we learned that in the culture of our home and uh, in a family, you, that's a question to think about. How do children learn to do emotions? How to have them, how to express them, how to hide them. And in every family, 
messages around having and demonstrating emotions are loud and clear, even though there hasn't been a word spoken. We all know that we have, when we think about how we as children were taught about our emotions and how people reacted to our emotions, we internalize that. It's called the parallel process in infant and early childhood mental health because what we experienced as children, oftentimes we watch our children experience it that same way or we wanna change it so that they experience it differently. And so understanding our own emotional upbringing and how it influences our parenting can help us establish a healthy family culture. And this applies to the parents and families that you work with too. Helping parents to understand what their emotional culture was that they grew up in will help them understand that they can establish a family culture of their own as far as emotions go. So this activity again is called My Emotional Landscape and we're gonna introduce it to you and then we're gonna give you an opportunity to experience it in breakout groups. So it looks like this. We'd like you to think about what culture you learned. What is the culture that you learned? So take a look at this slide for a second and if you, we'd like you to jot down uh, some of these questions that are over on the left. When I was angry, I would, how would you react when you were angry as a child? And then what would the adults around you do? And how did they make you feel? How did that make you feel when that happened? And do you have any ideas about what you wish would have happened? Do you wish it could have been different? Or was it okay for you? Because it may have been okay. And then also thinking about when you were sad, what would you do as a child? And then again, what would the adults around you do? And what were the feelings that came up for you? And now reflecting back on that and looking at it, what do you wish would have happened? Or were you grateful that something happened the way that it did? And then going through the next emotions, when I was afraid, I would do this. And when I was excited or happy, I would do this. And what would the adults around you do? So that is the first part of the activity, the culture that you learned, okay? And then we'd like you to think about the culture that you teach now as a professional, as a parent, as a grandparent, as an adult who cares about children. Um, when a child that you know is angry, what do they typically do? And how do you feel when they do that? And what is your default reaction? The thing that comes up that, that first type of thinking that we were introduced to yesterday. And then what would be another way that you could possibly do that? And then when a child you know is sad and when a child you know is fearful and when a child that you know expresses excitement or happiness. Now this activity is one that you're going to do individually, but this is definitely one that you could use with parents one-on-one. -on -one. You could use in a group setting or in a small group setting with parents to help them understand about social emotional competence and what were the things that they learned in their family culture about it. So I hope we gave you some time to jot down some of those questions because you're gonna be discussing those in your breakout rooms. Um, so let's walk you through the breakout rooms, what's gonna happen. We're gonna divide our group into two breakout rooms. Carrie's gonna do that for us. The first breakout room is gonna be for 10 minutes and we'd like you to use a couple minutes to reflect on what your emotion training is, the culture that you learned as a child. And then you're gonna discuss that with your group to the extent that you feel comfortable discussing that. Then we're gonna return back into our large group and we're gonna share our responses. What did we learn about how we learned to do emotions in our family and how we learned to react to emotions? And then we're gonna go after we've shared that, we're gonna go out into our second breakout room and then we're going to uh, use the My Emotion Training, the culture I teach now. What kind of culture do you teach to parents? What kind of culture do you teach to your own children? Uh, what kind of culture do you teach to uh, coworkers and your staff? And then we're gonna return and share that. Um, I like that idea of what we teach to our staff because that's just as important as what we share with families and young children and it's come up a couple of times for me that uh, the need to make sure that we're offering that same support that we do to families, to our staff, especially during 
during this time. So that is our plan for breakout rooms. We're hoping that this will give you a chance to reflect and, and think about what you learned and what you teach. So I'm gonna let Carrie guide us through going into breakout rooms, 10 minutes for each breakout room, and then we'll come, we'll do the first one, come back and share, and then the second one, come back and share. Great, thank you. Those were my two questions, so 10 minutes. Um, how, how big, small would you like the, the groups? So there's 81 total participants. Oh, I probably think five is the max, Carrie. Five is the max. All right, give me just a second. I'm gonna. All right, some will have four, um, and some will have five. And we're gonna go for 10 minutes. I'll do, um, I'll try to broadcast out some of those questions. I tried, I jotted that down, so you'll have a little quick reference if you didn't um, get it jotted down yourself. I'll give you some warnings in there, um, you know, like a two minute warning, one minute warning, and then we'll, we'll close out with a 15 second countdown and come back in. Everybody ready? Can someone give me a thumbs up? Okay. <laughs> All right, everyone, here we go. I, I didn't Hi, get Rainy. in a group, but that's okay. <laughs> you you didn't get into a group. Let me uh, let me move you to a new group and see if that if that pops you in. Okay. So you were in group twelve. I'm going to move you to group eight. Does that sound okay? Here we go. And I'm not moving, but that's okay because I think I'd really like to know how are you setting the timers on your Zoom? Because I use Zoom so often in my trainings. Oh, okay. Um, so once you you click to create those breakout groups, then um, and it shows you the number of groups and who's in each. There's this at the bottom an options button, and it's in there that you can say how much time and there's some other you know things you can do too. I think I haven't paid as much attention to that because I'm always kind of paying attention to the groups themselves. So I, I need to become more proficient. I'd love to have just a meeting with you. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it, you know, I've learned a lot through trial and error. <laughs> but yes, I'm so sorry. I'm not sure why that's not working for you. Um, did you get a 
happened to get a dialog box that said you shouldn't have, but that said, do you, you know, click to join? There was, I didn't get one this time, um, but there was one other person there. It was just a phone number and a black screen and there wasn't anybody there to talk to. So it was just me and one other person. Then that went away and another person showed up and then she went away. Oh, all right. Um, let me try one more time, right? Um, so I've got you in eight. It's showing you in group eight if you want to. No, they're already no. well into okay. their presentation. To come in in the middle would be kind of... Yeah, sure. We've got about five minutes left. So, <laughs> all right. Well, let's hope the next one works better for you. Oh, yeah. And I'm fine. I'm fine. It's good. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I do a lot of um, testing where I have my main computer that I'm on and then I'll have a laptop going and then I'll have a, my cell phone going so that I can sort of see <laughs> what it's like for the attendee and um, you know, sometimes I have to create my own audience, I guess, to do the testing. I like that. And who do you work for? Do you work for the um, Idaho Children's Trust Fund or the U of I? Or? I work, um, I'm at the University of Idaho. I'm um, at the Center on Disabilities and Human Development. And I am the director of a project that is funded by the Idaho State Department of Education. Um, and so the connection is through Shannon Dunstan, who is the uh, a board member with the tr trust fund. And I've worked with her a long time on that, that project. It's called the Idaho Training Clearinghouse, idahotc.com. And we put out uh, special education related training resources for K-12 educators. Very cool. Yeah, I work with the foster programs, um, but I have five special needs kids at home right now that we adopted five years ago. So I totally wow, get that. Wow, wonderful. Yeah. Um, our website, idahotc.com, is very oriented to educators. The They, being the State Department of Education, have wanted um, to move and prepare a section that would be directed towards parents. Um, so, you know, that might be coming down the road. But even so, I would, uh, I'm hopeful that maybe some of the things we have on there that um, would be, you know, regardless of it being an educator focus would be good for parents too. Yeah, right. What's the, what's the website? So it's Idaho TC. So the T stands for training, C for clearinghouse, dot uh, com. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, we have, we have an un, unique needs. So. Yeah. Yeah. Unique and many uh, with five. Unique yeah. Many. Yeah. So some of them are gifted and talented mm -hmm. and, and one of them is delayed, but they all have other special needs. So it makes it interesting. Yeah. Not, a, not a dull moment there. Lots of individualization. Huh, right? <laughs> yeah, we have 11 adult kids too, but they're out of the house. And then we have these five, so yeah. We've dealt with a lot of it, and I used to work in special ed, so it's. Oh, um, okay. Wonderful. Mental health or special ed, that's where I've been most of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in Idaho, or have you been around the country too? Yeah, mostly in Idaho. Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah, Eastern Idaho and the Boise area, Southwest area. Ah, okay, yes. I can't give it see. A two-minute two warning there. Um, looks like Wendy came back to join us. Wendy, let me know if there's something I can do to help. She doesn't have audio yet. There she is. Yeah. So, hi, Wendy. You came back to join us. Let me know if there's something I can do to help.
Hi, Amy, I see you've come back to join the main room. Just let me know if there's something I can do to help. And no worries, all are welcome here. You can leave a, a, a meant to go to the, oh, okay. <laughs> No worries. We've only got about 30 seconds, so we'll, we'll all come back to the main room here in just a, a few. for sharing yeah there we go people are filtering back in great so carrier are people able to if they unmute themselves in this bigger room now correct so I'm curious if anybody would share would like to share for just a minute or two um, what this experience was like or something like a key takeaway from your group when you talked about the culture that you learned around uh, emotions when you were growing up? Well, I, I learned that um, those the people that was in my group went through the exact same thing that I did. So it's kind of uh, refreshing, I guess, to see that there was other people that were brought up that way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It is. It's like we think that we're the only ones sometimes or our families are the only ones like that. And it's pretty common. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else want to share? This is Kristen McKee and I'll, I'll share from our group. Um, if y'all don't mind. <laughs> uh, I would say we had sort of a variety of, there were four of us that were able to talk and half of us had parents who sort of let us have our emotions uh, and that was okay the other half their parents wanted to change the emotions but all all four of us who were in the group uh one there were five of us but one person wasn't able to really join us which was very disappointing so just i don't want to leave her out um it, like our parents didn't do anything to support the emotions or talk about emotions or acknowledge that they could be talked about is that ladies does that feel like a good summary <laughs> i hope so it does it does <laughs> and it's interesting because i know for me personally as a parent I am intentionally very different, I think, because it took me so long as an adult to figure out my own emotions that it was really important for me as a parent to be able to honor how my kids were feeling, to give them that space and time to work through those things, um, which isn't always, that's not easy, but I think it's for mental, for good mental health and for resiliency, I think it's really important work to do. Yeah. I, I absolutely, I love the way that you said that. And it is very important work to do. And it's something that's relevant to all of us. We all have our own emotions and we all have our own experiences of how we learned to navigate our emotions. I know in our group, we shared that um, the emotions are expressed in a variety of ways, not just with words, right? It's in the tone, it's in expressions, it's in telling uh, telling us to go to your room when you have an emotion or that emotion isn't important because my emotion is bigger. Like somebody had said that she, if she felt stressed, her parents would tell her that's nothing. Like this is what real stress is <laughs> or, you know, grown up stress is more important than young uh, stress for a young child, which isn't true. And we kind of talked too about um, these, like what we talked about with patterns we have learned patterns really early on and sometimes we don't recognize them until we've become a parent ourselves, ourself. And then we see, oh, 
like this is a pattern for me and maybe I do want to keep that as a caregiver as a parent or maybe I don't and it's an opportunity to you know make change if that's what we decide is important to us Holly do you should we move on time wise I think that would be great. We can okay. go out into our second breakout room where you're going to be discussing the emotional culture that you want to teach now. And I loved uh, Carrie segued us into that so beautifully with her comments about honoring uh, her children's emotions. So think about uh, in your own life with your own family, what you want to teach and what and what you want to give parents the opportunity to teach that you work with. So thank you, Carrie, for taking us to that breakout room. Wonderful. And I just want to do a quick time check so that you have enough time when you come back. If we do 10 minutes, that's just a one minute back. Do you want me to shorten this one? Would you a little bit because we're coming up on time. Thank you. Sounds good. All right, everyone, here we go. Hi, Angelina and Eileen, I see you're in the room with me. Just uh, let me know via chat or audio if there's something I can do to help. Hi, it's Eileen. So my, I switched over to my phone um, because my computer, my internet connection was unstable. Sure. And it disconnected me. So I'm now on via yeah, yeah, phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and I just turned off the computer. So you shouldn't hear that echoing noise anymore. Great. So I'll, um, I'm going to assign you to a room real quick here and see if we can yeah. get you in. Okay, perfect. perfect. Thank you.
different, and that's not a bad thing. <coughs> Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I hope that that was a, a rich opportunity for everyone in my group. I certainly learned a lot. Um, and I'd like to hear what everybody else learned for just a second, if anyone has anything that they'd like to uh, share with us. We talked about responding with empathy and how important that is and how it makes children feel valued. Empathy also really works for any age, but just sitting in the hard moments with someone can be so powerful. Yep, there's a profound power in just being there with someone. Thank you, Renee. I'll jump in, Holly. Um, we talked about how often children's emotions as a parent, their big emotions make us feel uncomfortable or scared or angry. Uh, we might, you know, jump into whatever they're feeling or get angry at them because of what they're feeling. And that um, we need to learn to accept our own emotions, but also model for them that all of these, all of their emotions are okay. And that, um, you know, that we're okay and we can, and they're accepted no matter what they're feeling. Exactly. Just acknowledging them. Um, I think it's important for parents to remember that all those emotions bring up behaviors, like you said, Maureen, and behavior is just communication. So as a parent, remembering that their behavior is communicating something to me about what emotion they're feeling and, and what is the way that I can support them in that and acknowledge that emotion. Um, there was um, some research that I just, that I had read, talked about when kindergarten children enter kindergarten, uh, they, they did some research and they found that they usually know the equivalent of like 2.5 emotion words. And usually the emotion words that they know and understand are mad and sad. And so we know that there's so many other emotions that children feel. And when parents are able to acknowledge those emotions and name those emotions for children, they're able to tame them for children too and give them opportunities to learn how to self-regulate. Um, anything else that you'd like to share from your group about the culture that you want to teach? I think in one thing about it that we talked about in this group and in the previous group I was in is uh, remembering emotions are opportunities for connection. They often can lead to disconnection if we aren't being with or we're pushing against emotions, but to, to think of them in that way. Each emotion is a, a chance to feel understood or to understand the other person. Exactly. Thank you, Kristen. Was there anything in the chat box that I may have missed? Probably just me saying that um, it's uh, straight up at the top of the hour. So, okay. Well, then we will move on. Thank you, Carrie. All right. Kristen just uh, brought up that understanding emotions, acknowledging emotions are opportunities. And so for the next 15 minutes, we've talked now about the protective factors, the strong curriculum. We've talked about uh, as adults, how we manage that social emotional competence. Then we did the exercise about learning about emotions. And now we're gonna talk about children's emotions and what we as care providers or parents can do to support social emotional competence with children for the time we have left. And so Kristen brought up opportunities. Holly? And I yes. I'm so sorry. Um, the schedule is that we close these sessions at the top of the hour and we go back for the last 15 minutes of the day for closing remarks. Oh, we are done. I know, we are done. Oh boy, well this really changes things for me. I was going to share with you some really, some things that I was really excited about, but we're going to go ahead and close. Um, there is one thing I just want to share before we go. 
And that is, we were going to go over a tool that's called the Simple Interactions Tool. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, know where that tool was. If you'll go to simpleinteractions.org, it gives uh, four steps that you can do to have very simple and deep interactions with young children. And it's about connection, reciprocity, inclusion, and opportunities for growth. And uh, go to this site, look at this tool. This tool is such a simple way to think about the interactions that you have with young children. And it's a really powerful tool, I think, for, for, for us and for uh, your staff, providers that you work with, children, uh, parents. So, so think about that. Um, and the last thing, I'm feeling a little dysregulated, but the last thing I want to, uh, we want to share with you is kind of some wrap up points. And that is that you can have healthy outcomes through positive experiences. We know that from everything that we've been learning today. And so when it feels disheartening to learn that trauma changes the brain, remember that healing changes the brain too. And remember that learning, growth, security, and healing happen within the context of relationships. Everything happens within the context of relationships. That's why social emotional competence is so important. And then remember that there's a profound power in just being with someone. We don't have to fix it. We don't have to solve it. We just can be with them. And then remember that social and emotional health is the foundation for personal well-being and for healthy relationships. And so social and emotional competence is so important. Please, if you want more information about social and emotional com competence, the protective factors, you're welcome to reach out to Kristen or I or contact the Idaho Children's Trust Fund. Taryn can help guide you through that or um, go straight to, door, to Maureen for if you're interested in the curriculum. So with that, it's always better to leave on a high note. And that high note is that we hope that you learn from each other. We hope that sharing was beneficial for you today. And we hope you have a sense of what the culture you want to teach based on social emotional competence. So thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you, everyone. I know. Please go to the closing remarks session.